Hey guys, welcome back to the shop. So all the parts have come in to rebuild the headstock on the engine lathe. The, these are the, the three spindle bearings. I bought these uh, as new old stock on eBay. And then the rest of the, there's two lip seals and the rest of the bearings. And I'm going to replace the smaller external snap rings because the Chinese ones stretched out on me. And then I'm going to replace all the O-rings for the shift controls. And I did get, just for fun, get a quote on the spindle bearings from my local distributor. And they're about $800 a piece. So luckily I was able to buy these on eBay for substantially cheaper than that. So all in you're looking at about $1,200 worth of parts on this, on this pile right here. So that's just reality. You you got to pay to play when it comes to precision machine tools. You know this stuff is expensive, and there's no way around it. And it's a real kick in the teeth for hobbyists and and guys who didn't come from the industry side to find out how much some of these things cost. So I actually went through these gears and and pointed the teeth. Uh, you can see this one right here. So there's. There's really no easy way to do this. Like I said, they're normally done with a tooth rounding machine, but they either skipped that step or they did a really crappy job on about half the gears. So I just used a three inch cutoff wheel on a die grinder and it works okay. Gotta be a little bit careful because it's easy to nick the teeth. You can see I got a little, a little carried away there, but I don't think it'll hurt anything.
So I know this is the last shaft because it doesn't have a snap ring on this end for the bearing. So uh, there is a snap ring on the end of this shaft. So it has to go in before this shaft blocks access to that snap ring. So before I can I can proceed with installing the bearings, I have to take some measurements. And the, the thing I need to check is basically the amount of crush on the face of the bearing. So this is the outer race of the thrust bearing, this is a spacer, and this is the outer race of the cylindrical bearing, and those get stacked up and pressed into the front of the headstock. And what we want is there's a bearing retainer that bolts on the outside here and it holds the the bearings tight against this shoulder and we want a thou to a thousandth and a half of interference so that's our crush and you cannot just take the old bearings out put the new bearings in and expect it to be correct and actually in this case it's way wrong so I just measured the the width of the bearing the width of the spacer the width of the other bearing added those up and that's this number here 3.2188 and then I used a depth mic to measure from this base to the bottom shoulder and that's this number here and this sixty thousandths is the step in the bearing retainer so the bearing retainer actually has a step this is the shoulder right here that presses against the race and this comes up against the face of the, the headstock casting so anyway what you can see is that in the front I have right now 15 thousandths of crush and at the rear I have a 35 thousandths gap and the bearings aren't that much different from the old bearings so I guess they just didn't even check that and that this is important you gotta have the right crush because if you have too much crush uh, you can actually distort these bearings and if you don't have enough then the bearings can actually rotate in this bore in the headstock. This is a pretty light press fit. It's like 50 millionths press fit and if you don't have something holding that bearing it, you know it can tear the the, the uh, bore up pretty quickly. I actually had this happen to me once when I was when I was in college I was doing a project for a company and they they had a, a bearing journal line board and when they line board it they also machined this face and they didn't check the depth after the the machining was done before they installed the bearing and there was a gap and pretty quickly the bearing outer bearing race destroyed the line board surface and we had to have them come back in and redo it so you gotta check that so you also need to check this spacer and you want to make sure that the faces are parallel within about one tenth or as close as you can get it alright we've got the bearing retainers machined and we're ready to put the spindle together all right, one more thing. This is the front bearing retainer, and this is the, the labyrinth seal right here for the front bearing. At the bottom, you should see this drain hole, and that's for the front part of the labyrinth seal, which is supposed to seal out coolant and whatever from getting into the bearing. You need to make sure you clean that out. You usually just use a small drill bit. And if you, if you haven't cleaned yours on your machine in a while, it's a good thing to do. The labyrinth seal won't work without the drain.
Okay, it's time for the fun part, which is setting the bearing preload. So I've got the got everything tightened up, snugged up, and uh, at this time I've got about two thousandths, sorry, two tenths of free play in the front bearing. So what I'm going to do is the pitch on the nuts here is two millimeters. And the taper on the bore of the bearing is 1 to 12. So I'm going to do the math to figure out how far I need to turn the nut in order to get it down to 1,000th preload. Sorry, 1,000th play, then 0 play, and then we'll take it up to about 80 millionths preload on the front bearing. Okay, so roughly the same rules apply at the rear bearing. So you see now, it's about three tenths play in the rear bearing. And I want to take it down to between two and one and a half tenths play at the rear bearing. So we don't want preload on the rear bearing because, well number one, because it doesn't need to be that tight. And number two, because when the, when the spindle gets warm, it's going to expand and we want it not to bind inside the headstock casting so by leaving this this bearing slightly loose we can allow the spindle to grow so yeah three tenths right now we want to take it down about half that so what i found is that uh, these the bearing nuts have six wrench flats on them and every one of those that you turn basically pushes the bearing pushes the bearing 14 thousandths up on the taper and uh, the the uh, reference that I found suggests that you should use 1 to 14 instead of 1 to 12 as your ratio of expansion because this is a hollow spindle and it will actually compress slightly just as the race will expand the spindle will compress so for every one wrench flat it moves the bearing 14 thousandths forward which expands it approximately one-tenth. So, uh, I need to move it, looks like about one and a half wrench flats, and then uh, double check. All right, I think everything's back together. I've got to put the backsplash back on and mount the chuck and we'll take one last look inside before I put the cover on and start the run in. I ran the, the hydraulic pump or the uh, lube pump and everything is working there. Uh, all the gears seem to shift okay. Yeah, I think we're, I think we're in good shape.
So I had to finish my, my bearing run in, but so far everything looks great. Temperatures are good, and it's substantially quieter. Like, substantially quieter. Especially on, on a deceleration, it's never been this quiet. So I, I know a lot of people will look at a job like this and say, you know, I have no idea where to even start. It just looks like a jumbled up mess of gears and shafts, and, and it is, but I, I guarantee you that it will only go together one way. And when I, when I put this gearbox back together, the only thing I had to go on was a few pictures and this terrible kind of cheesy drawing from the manual. This is the only parts diagram that I have for the whole machine. And all it does is tell you the pitch, or the, sorry, number of teeth on the gears. So you just have to have some confidence and, uh, you know, a little bit of mechanical inclination. And you can figure out how to put this thing back together, I guarantee. So uh, I thought I would just briefly mention a few things that might help you along the way if you ever have to do a job like this. So you'll see me using this tool a lot. And uh, this is a snap-on uh, bearing driver, bearing race driver. And I've had this thing for like at least 10 years. And it was probably another inch longer when I first got it. I just keep grinding the ends down, but super handy for work like this. Um, there's the number if anybody's interested. So you'll see me use these bronze or brass punches a lot and they're really nice for for certain jobs but I I would not recommend using them for the installation of bearings especially spindle bearings because the problem with them is that they they tend to to chip and flake off and you're gonna get all those particles embedded into your bearing you notice when we were putting the gearbox together that there's a lot of instances where you basically have no choice but to press the bearing in you know by putting pressure on the balls which you're never supposed to do but they just don't give you any choice you know the when you have two you know two ball bearings back to back you know there's no way you can get a tool in there to push on the outer race you, you have to do it that way so luckily you know in these gearboxes the press fits are pretty light so you're really not you know putting that much pressure the wrong way on the bearings so I know it kind of makes me cringe too but you just don't get a choice and the other thing I wanted to say is as far as sealing the bearing retainers uh, this machine does not use gaskets some machines do if it uses gaskets you probably should replace the gaskets because they're going to be a calculated thickness um, but what I like to use is this stuff here this is Permatex 3 but it's basically the same as this stuff here, which is Permatex number two. And if you ever work with an old timer, when they say Permatex, this is what they're talking about. They just call it Permatex. And it's an, a non-hardening gasket, basically replacer. And the reason that I like this stuff is that it, A, it's non-hardening. So it will set up, but it doesn't get hard. So it, it remains pliable, which is important for, you know, machines that go through temperature cycles. And then it's also much, much easier to get it apart if it doesn't fully harden. The other one that you can use too, this is Hylomar Universal Blue. It's basically the same stuff, um, but it's, you know, more expensive because it's for aviation. What you absolutely don't want to use is RTV silicone. RTV silicone has no business anywhere near precision bearings. It's terrible stuff. I hate it. So the other good thing about this stuff is that you can really get a thin film. So this stuff and the Hylomar both uh, basically can be can be spread to a film that's half a thousand thick. And that's what you want for these bearing journals because you've done all the precision calculations to make sure you've got you know the proper amount of of crush on your bearing you don't want to ruin it by using some super thick gasket material alright guys thanks for sticking around to the end of the video I know it's been a long haul on this project
but I'm glad that it actually is done. So I haven't done anything to address the other issues that we found in the evaluation, you know, the wear in the cross slide and the alignment of the headstock. So I will do that and that will be the subject of future videos. But for now the machine's back together and I can use it. And that's very important. So um yeah this this YouTube channel definitely has taken off recently. I can remember when it was extraordinary for a video to get more than 40 views and uh, you know, we're doing a lot better than that now. I believe we're over 500 subscribers now so yeah things are really taking off and uh, you know I never ask people to subscribe or you know like if you want to that's up to you but please do leave comments. I, I like reading through the comments I try to reply to everybody that you know asks a question or you know just has something to something to say that's interesting so yeah uh, the comment system on YouTube is kinda of, kinda of broken but we have to work with what we have so thanks for watching guys